How's it going? Good. Everybody's well fed and got extra cookies if you're into that thing, because I am. I got extra cookies and I had a hunt for the chocolate chip, but I found one, so that's good. Um, yeah, so I, um, I, my company's Papaya Internet, and uh, I started uh, Papaya Internet in 2004. We do SEO, SEM, and analytics, and then a bunch of other stuff that help uh, businesses rank um, and sell things online. Um, and I, I did get my start at Florida State. I, had, I have a baby face, at least that's what my mom tells me. Um, but I've been doing this a while. So I started in 1998, which is hard to believe um, that I've been on the internet that long and don't have like a paper trail and people still want me to speak. Um, so, uh, but, but my focus really is on SEO and SEM and today we're going to talk about um, site structure for SEO. So um, I'm single, so I'm going to give you a list of the things that I like. Um, <laughs> So I like technology, I like WordPress, duh. Um, I like puns, um, much to my friend's chagrin. Um, and if you laugh at my jokes, I will tell you more. Um, I love RuPaul's Drag Race, one of my favorite TV shows on, on TV. Um, I love improv, and I love flan. I'm from Miami, so I eat flan wherever I go. And I love vinyl records. So this is my record collection. Um, it's sort of ordered, uh, you can't tell maybe unless you recognize those, those uh, spines, but yeah, I have it in order, alphabetical order. But it's a little messy, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of keeping, I'm not having enough space for all the vinyl records that I have, um, but it doesn't look like this, <laughs> uh, thankfully. This, uh, <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, it looks like some, some websites, right? Now you, you got the metaphor. Um, so this, Actually, this would be a beautiful dream of mine. I would just spend all day looking at this stuff, and I'm sure that the person who owns this collection knows where every single piece of vinyl that is in this collection, for the most part. But if anybody else comes to this collection, they look at it, and they're going to be like, where do I go? Like, uh, where do I begin? I don't know. Do I begin here? Do I begin here? That, like, well, that record cover looks pretty nice. Uh, yeah, so there's no order to this madness, right? Uh, except for the person who owns it. And as we know on the web, we have people coming to the sites. We're not the only person visiting our own website. I mean, maybe, but most likely not, right? We're on the internet, so um, we want people to come to our website. So here's an example of organized record collection. This is by Mark Apple. If you haven't met him, he's over there. Um, he showed me this record collection when he knew I was giving a talk about, that includes talking about vinyl records to show off his beautiful wood carved, carved tabs. The, how he organizes it, just to show me how I can do it, um, if I ever organize my record collection. But anyway, so that's, it's a nice looking collection, right? You know holidays, there's country music, um, I think that's soundtracks at the end. So, you know, Mark knows where everything is, and if any, I wanted to come in and steal his records, I could find all the stuff that I want, you know? So, um, yeah, so what is website structure, right? Uh, site structure is how the pages are on, your, on your site are linked to one another. So why is it important to have a good site structure? Um, it does two things. It easily helps visitors find the content that's on your site, and it allows search engines to easily find that wonderful content you worked so hard to create. So if we look at the different types of site structures there are, um, there's, about, there's two of them. Uh, one is a flat site structure. Um, usually this is a site structure where the home page links to all the content that's on your site. Right? Um, it's, you're one click away from the home page. Uh, you're, you don't have to click so many th different links in order to get to the content. Um, and so you find that a lot with like brochure sites, right? Um, or if you're just starting out and you only have like a handful of pages that you're linking to. So you can link all the stuff on the home page. Problem is, is that it limits the number of pages um, and uh, the the problem is, is that it, 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 you are, once your site starts to grow, then you limit yourself as to like, how many links that you could put on your page, right? So, um, but the good thing is, is that people can find all your stuff easily, right? Um, if we look at deeper site structure, um, there's a longer click path that's involved, right? Um, their co content gets grouped into different types of themes and buckets. So like, for instance, we have different categories and then other pages that fall into those categories. Um, and you're increasing the number of clicks 
uh, to get people to your content. However, your content ends up becoming more organized as a result. So uh, if we look at the disadvantages of having a flat site structure, um, you, uh, you get minimal clicks for the content, but your content, all your content ends up on the root folder. So as you start to develop your content, because you've all attended wonderful talks like April's talk when she was talking about developing content and having a content s schedule, then you, your website is going to grow and grow. And you can't really link all those pages from the home page because when, you, when, you're, when a visitor comes to your home page, then you're giving them too many options, right, on um, what to click. So you want them to follow a path when they come to your site. So as your site grows, then having the deeper structure becomes more important. Additionally, um, search engines have trouble understanding the context of the content that, that you have if it's all, all off the route. So, in fact, John Mueller, who is the, the uh, Webmaster Trends Analyst at Google uh, and hosts this great uh, live stream called uh, Webmaster Cent from Webmaster Central, says that if we're only seeing these URLs through your sitemap, then we don't really know how they are related to one another. And so it makes it very hard for Google to understand how relevant this piece of content is into the context of your website. So when you start thinking about, like, say, you go to a library, for instance, right? You walk into a library, and you don't see just books scattered all around, right? Um, there's a system in place. So the, the top-level system is like fiction, nonfiction, and then you have like reference books, right? And then even into those different sections of the library, you have uh, different types of books that fall under it, like biographies, right? If you're talking about nonfiction, you're talking about biographies, you're talking about historical books, they all have their place, right? And then within those, um, in, within those subsections are different um, are different books even within those subsections. So um, Google looks at it the same way, where you are, it, it, it has a better understanding once you start grouping your content as your site starts to grow. So it's like a pyramid, right? Um, so you have like a hierarchical, hierarchical, I always have trouble with that word, hierarchical organization of your content. So it's like the top level, like I was saying, like fiction, nonfiction. Then you have like biographies, uh, and it, it all grows, it comes down off the top, uh, just like this Triforce. And, uh, and so when, as your start, site starts to grow, let's say you have an e-commerce site, you might have even subcategories that fall under each of those categories. And then you could have pages that are connected to those different, different categories. So uh, an example is like product categories on an e-commerce site, blog topics, um, company departments, if you're thinking of a news site, like different sections of the newsroom at a, uh, like the New York Times, for, for example, they all, have, they all cover different topics, right? And so their site is actually designed in a way that you can find different topics. You can go to the different topics and find the articles that are part of that topic. So if we go back and look at, at the, um, if we look at the deeper site structure, this is where it all comes into play, where you have different categories and pages that are connected to those categories. So, how do we establish hierarchy in WordPress? Pages. So pages is a great way to organize your content into hierarchies. Has anybody done that in, in WordPress before on your pages? OK, a handful of you. Yeah. So in, for this example, um, the Georgia Voice is a client of mine. And we organize their, their pages into different types of topics. And so they're covering different organizations that are within the city of Atlanta, and so you can see that they have organizations as the top level, and then they have art organizations, business organizations, health organizations, um, and then nightlife, of course, uh, as an organization. So th they're organizing all their different content into buckets. The other place where you can set hierarchies within categories. And so when you think about your posts, all your posts get assigned a category, right? or you can assign them category. Um, and so even within the categories themselves, you can set up in a hierarchy so that if you have lots of articles that are associated with categories, you can have even, you can drill down into like, for instance, culture, we drill down to art, book, and books, and dance, right? So how many of y'all are using categories for your posts? How many of you are, have zero posts assigned to uncategorized? You guys are awesome. How many do have posts assigned to uncategorized? It's okay, I won't shame you. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so like think when you start thinking about your posts and writing your posts for your for your for your blog, for instance, here's where you can assign these different categories so that you start putting the logical structure where your content is is associated with a specific topic. So um, you can start digging into those uncategorized posts and start assigning them specific uh, specific categories to each of those posts. Um, so sometimes you have a theme that has plugins or you install a plugin right for to help make things easier, like a portfolio, right? Or like for instance, this one here in particular, where they have employees where they use a, post, a custom post type for employees. Uh, it's another way to organize information and, it, and, and automatically puts it into a hierarchy, right? And if we get really fancy, we can customize our URL structures so that um, we can set these different categories. Like the top one is actually the page level, right? That we were looking at in the first example. The second is for um, for blog posts, for the the post category. And then the last is the team. That's the custom post type where we have the URL structure where it shows team and then uh, the name of the the employee at the at the firm. So you start to see some hierarchy within the URL structure itself. So as I mentioned, these are the different types of uh, groupings that you can have. Um, you know, e-commerce size product categories is probably the most common, um, but blog topics too, um, and and like company departments within your in your business or within your client's business, you can set these hierarchies within that as well. And the, the, another pro tip about the the categories is that you can actually optimize the categories themselves. A lot of times, what I find with WordPress sites is that Categories are set, but then there's no content that's on the category itself, right? The category just lives by itself with a bunch of posts that are associated with it. But you can actually start to optimize those categories so they can serve as landing pages. Um, if, if you heard about like HubSpot and their pillar content um, methodology where they have like a large topic that links to other different topics that are related to it, um, that, this applies here where you can optimize the category for SEO so you can get those keywords for that general topic and then your topics that are related to that uh, topic that are get a little more granular, they can um, get linked from these within the category page and then you're helping feed that relevancy all the way down into your posts. Because a lot of times what happens with posts is that they get buried, right? If you go through your like, if you just have all your posts under your blog, for instance, and you go through your archive of your blog post, and you have a lot of blog posts, they they end up on page two and page three of your blog, right? And so, if you start assigning categories to your blog posts and you optimize those categories, you're making it easier for not only people to come find your content that's related to that category, but you're also um, making it easier for search engines to find those pages that have been long buried down within your archives. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Um, all right, so let's talk about site navigation um, and how this all applies to that. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Um, so Limit is trying to get to four levels. So you don't want to get too granular with your subcategories because then you know you're you can come up with a subcategory for just about anything, right? Um, but ideally, you don't want to get to more than four levels deep. Yeah. So um, looking at navigation, uh, we're going to use eBay as an example because I think eBay does a really good job at putting um, putting all the important elements on their in their navigation. And so you can see that they're thinking about different people who come to the site, right? And this is on the this is basically going to the eBay homepage and looking at the navigation up there. They have the selling tools, right? Like my eBay to look at your account on the top right hand corner, right? They've got that big search bar. Um, they they've got the the login and sign in, right? Those are all important things that they see that clients need to do. But a lot of the focus is all the different categories that they have, right? Um, so having a good navigation helps people find the content on your site that you want them to find, right? Um, it also can help show the hierarchy, right? So you can break down the hierarchy into these like different menus that you have within your site. And then, like I mentioned before, um, if you start having lots of content, then you don't want to link to every little page that you have on your site. And that's like where categories can come in, where you can link 
to all the different categories that you have, and then they can get to those important pages. So if we start looking, drilling down into the, the navigation for eBay, you can see that they have different categories, right, for all the different shopping. So motors, fashion, they see these as the most important, right? Uh, electronics, collectibles, um, home and garden. And so even within electronics, you can see that they're linking to subcategories, right? So under electronics, you see cameras, smart, um, smart home, tablets, and then there's these additional categories, right? Because eBay knows that a lot of people are looking at these sub-subcategories, and so they want to put those front and center within the navigation. So they're not linking to every single category. Like you notice there's no turntables up here, right? I mean, not that many people are really buying records, right? But some people are, like me, and like Mark. And so, but you're not going to find that up here. More people are going to be more inclined to buy iPhones and, and laptops than vinyl records. Um, breadcrumbs are also a way to help nav navigate people within your site. And so it improves the user experience for those who land on maybe some of your pages that get higher rankings um, and may not be coming to your home page directly. Um, and it also tells um, search engines the site structure and how it looks, right? Gives them a good idea of what that site structure is. And, I'm sorry? How do I, how do I make a break? Breadcrumb? Yeah, so um, with, uh, depending on your theme and depending on the uh, plugin that you use, um, some themes like Genesis will allow you to have breadcrumbs and you just have to check a checkbox to enable it. Um, Yoast also, Yoast SEO plugin also offers some um, breadcrumb abilities. Yeah, and, and you have to put some extra code into, um, I think, your functions PHP in order to activate the breadcrumbs. So, and it looks at your current site structure as you have it set. So for instance, in this navigation here, um, this is using, uh, this is like a product navigation where it's looking at the home and then there's the category for cookware and then we drill it down to the brand and then the actual um, uh, subcategory there. So, and the, and the plus side to doing this also is that Google will sometimes display your breadcrumb navigation within the search results if you have the metadata put in. And most of those breadcrumb plugins will, will, allow you, will include that, that, uh, that metadata. Cool. So, thinking about your navigation, make it easier for people to find the important parts of your site. Usability is key. Um, don't overwhelm the visitor with all the different navigate, all the, with your menu, basically. Um, use anchor text that makes it clear that what the, the link is that they're clicking to. Um, and organize it as it mirrors your, uh, your site architecture. So let's talk about the home page, okay? Um, the home page serves as your navigational hub for all the visitors that come to your site. A lot of people will come to your site typing in your d domain name, or they may be searching for your business, and then your site comes up, right? And so they're most likely coming to your homepage. Um, not always, but most, some, because sometimes you might have a piece of content that gets viral, right, and that gets more traffic, but most of the time it's, they're coming to your homepage. Um, so use the homepage to link to those important pages. This example is using Amazon from when it first launched, right around the time it launched. And so you can see even then, they were linking to these important pages like the spotlight and one million titles and bragging about the fact that they have a million titles, right? Um, and then your account, just like we were looking at eBay, right? They know that people want to look at their account and see the status of their order, so they make sure that that's on the homepage. More recently, this is eBay's homepage. Uh, this was in January, so um, the big thing was like tidying up, right? Like Marie Kondo, uh, sparking joy, right? And, She's about to pull all that stuff out of her closet and you know, start deciding which one is going to spark joy and she's going to hug it and, and get rid of it, right? <laughs> um, so so they, <laughs> eBay knows this, so it's like, okay, we're going to link to a bunch of products that can help people organize, right? And so there's a lot of winter things going on. There's the big game, so it was around the Super Bowl, so they know people are looking for TVs, right? Got to have the nicest TVs in order to bring my friends to watch the Super Bowl. And, uh, and then there's like winter gear. so. This is all the important stuff that they want. They also want people to click on ads, right? Um, and th because they know a lot of people come to their site. And they also want people to sign up for credit cards. So they put all that stuff on their homepage. Okay, let's talk about contextual linking. 
Contextual links are links that um, link between the different pages within your site. And so that the contextual linking um, links to important pages and provides clues and search engines as to which pages are important. Right? It helps connect related content and allows visitors to find content that they may not be aware exists on your site. Give you an example of this. Um, this is an article about um, this very obscure band. I don't know if you guys remember the KLF, but they were like an avant-garde techno band from the early 90s who are famous for having a big pop hit and then burning a, a million pounds sterling on stage um, because, because of art. Um, so, so anyway, so like this is an article from The Guardian talking about their big comeback in 2017, but really they just wrote a book. And so the, the article itself links, and I know the text is a little hard to read because this is not really good usability because you're using brown text and it's hard to tell that that's a hyperlink text, but it is. Um, those text links link to individual articles within the site. So this is an article about their comeback and about their book. And that link on the, lo the lower left is linking to the book review itself. And those two top links are linking to pages that are about them on the Guardian's website. So this is, and, and if you notice, the, the, the text is Bill Drummond, Jim Cotty, right? So those texts are actually articles about those people and it's using anchor text, which is the text that's underlined, to just inform and describe what that page is about. Notice there's no click here, right? <laughs> click here, no more, no now, uh, you know, hyperlinked. It is telling what that page is about. And that's important for Google to understand and for people to understand what that information is. I don't know how many times I've seen like this here and I'm like, I don't know what that is. Like click here, what is this click here? Yeah, it, it, visually, if I'm trying to get to something, then knowing what that page is about and knowing that text that informs that hyperlink helps me. Another example of contextual links is like on Amazon, I was shopping for, for um, uh, protein shakes because, um, I, or protein shakes, whatever. Um, <laughs> so um, these are all suggested items based on me looking at this, this protein. So. Um, Obviously, the text is very informative, right? It tells me exactly what it is, and you can see somebody really SEO'd the you know what about for these uh, listings because they put every keyword within that title. <laughs> but it tells me what that page is about, right? So I, if I'm interested in, in a different flavor, I may click on one of those other links rather than the one that I'm on. So it's helpful. Another contextual link is tags. Um, so if your content, if you're using tags on your, on your site, that's another way to help people find other content on your site. Um, but they don't have a hierarchy, so they're not like categories. Categories have a hierarchy, tags do not. Um, an example would be like on a recipe site, you look at recipe ingredients, those could serve as your tags. Um, and they shouldn't compete with your categories. Um, so if you're using the same tags and categories interchangeably, then um, it's time to rethink how do you want to use your tags, um, especially tags. I see it all the time with tags because a lot of times you have people involved with your content who may not be aware and they're like, oh, I know I need to add keywords, so I'm just going to start adding tags. And then you look at, you go into the WordPress dashboard and you see all the tags that you have and all of a sudden you have like 500 tags that you weren't aware existed. Each of those tags do generate pages on the site, right, within WordPress. And so what you might find is that these tags just don't have enough content on those pages. So um, I always recommend doing an audit when it comes to that, and we'll talk about that in a sec. Um, so as I mentioned, audit your blog posts. Like, look, for, um, look at your content that you already have on your site. Is there a page that's related to the content that you just wrote? then link to it. Make sure to have a link that within your content that links to that other piece of content that's strongly related. Um, use descriptive anchor text and avoid things like click here. All right, so all right, now that I've bombarded you with all this stuff, what are we going to do next? Well, first, don't burn down the house. You don't have to do that. You don't have to set everything on fire. Um, but there's some things you can do to just get a good assessment and a good idea of what to do next. So um, one good thing is to look at your site structure. If you haven't done this so already, um, there are tools that you can find and use that can help crawl your site and give you a picture of what your site structure looks like. 
Um, Screaming Frog SEO is a great tool. It's a desktop app that you can use in Windows and on the Mac. Um, it is a, I guess, a freemium model where it's free for like 500 links, but if your site is, or 500 pages, but if your site is larger than that, you have to pay. Uh, it's like $150. Um, and it is an indispensable tool, not just for like SEO work, but actually just getting an understanding of, of your site and looking at the technical pieces around your site. So I highly recommend Screaming Frog SEO. Um, the SEO chat website crawler is not one that gets mentioned very often, but it's also a free tool. Um, and you can just have it crawl your site and they'll give you a, a picture. It's not a pretty picture, but it, it's a, it's a, it'll give you an idea of what your structure looks like. Um, Power Mapper and Dino Mapper are all paid tools, um, but they also do similar things and they can generate site maps for you. Although it, we're using WordPress, so we, we can find a plugin that works for that, right? Um, so another thing you do is sketch out your, your structure. So grab a pen and paper. Look at the important things that, um, that are uh, the important content or the important subject areas that you want to cover on your site. Right? Can you group these ideas together? Um, and, and step away from the computer for a second because uh, a lot of times we're just plugging in content or writing content. Um, I need to do that more. But um, you know, we're adding more and more content. We kind of forget what we're doing with our site. And so just getting an idea of what our focus is can help us put all this content together that we have. And like I mentioned, don't want to go more than four levels deep. Um, Lucidchart is where I created these, um, the, the site structure before, is, is a tool that you can use. And, and Glue Maps is also another tool where you can just map these out. Um, but yeah, using pen and paper, mind mapping tools, those are all great ideas that take you away from your site itself and think about, restart thinking about your content. Um, I mentioned this a little earlier, like audit your, con audit your categories and tags. Think about what your categories are. Um, look at the list. Are your cat do you have a plural and a singular version of a specific word, right? Um, have you put too many categories that you don't need? Is your uncategorized have a bunch of blog posts that are associated with it? Clean those out. Um, and also, if you have contributors, come up with a plan so people understand when they're adding content to the site, there are categories that should be assigned and not to create additional ones. And clean up your tags. But we already talked about that, right? You guys are all going to do that, right? Clean up your tags? <laughs> all right, cool. Um, site maps. So we touched on this a little bit. Um, look, at Your site map displays the site hier hierarchy on, uh, an HTML site map displays the site hierarchy on your site. You, those are less and less common now, um, but you can still do that. Google will crawl your site and crawl your HTML sitemap uh, if that's something that you want to add to your site. Um, an XML sitemap is like one that is generated from Yoast and generated from, um, and from any other sitemap plugin that you can upload to Google uh, and Bing. Do, how many of y'all are using a Google Search Console? How many are not? OK. When you go home today, uh, those who haven't, um, you can easily sign up for Google Search Console. It basically gives you a sense as to how Google sees your site, how Google crawls your site. Um, and you get email alerts in case they find something wrong with your site. Um, but it's a great way to see how Google is, when they crawl the site, what do they see? Are they seeing a lot of errors? And it's free. Uh, it's a free tool, so I highly recommend you do that, and you can submit your sitemap to it. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 not necessarily. I mean, it, what, what it could do, I mean, if you're really concerned about that, you could also set it to no index so that Google doesn't index it and, and, and send those links through. Um, but it, 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 it helps users. So like the, the thing that I find, is, uh, especially with when it comes to SEO, is that um, you know, never trump usability over um, SEO, right? Like you, you want to find a happy balance for the two. And so if, if it's going to help your visitors come to your site to find content, um, then 
I, I think it's a good thing. Plus, you don't have to link to every single last page in your sitemap. You can limit it to a, a certain number of pages just so they can get through and get, find the, where, what they're looking for. So, um, cool. So if you start updating your, um, your, site, your site structure, start updating your URLs, you want to make sure that um, you have 301 redirects in place. And 301 is a, is a directive that's sent to uh, browsers and crawlers that uh, this page has been moved to a new location permanently. And so uh, it sets a new canonical for the URL. So if you have a page that has links pointing to it, then you want to make sure that if you change that URL that it gets redirected. Otherwise, you're going to have 404 errors. So hopefully this helped you guys uh, think about how to restructure your site so it doesn't look so much like this and it looks more like this. Cool. Thank you very much. We, we have time for Q&A? Yeah, it is 1.30 now, so we have about 20 minutes, so you have a good bit of time for questions here. Okay. Just repeat the question, put the camera in here. We'll yeah, there. you got it. Yeah. Uh, 301 redirect, is that something that goes into the head page, or, or does that, well, the WordPress version is really the same thing. Where does it, that it depends. I mean, it could, uh, but usually, what's that? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, does you're asking whether the the 301 redirect goes into the head of the page? Where does it go? Where does it go? It depends. Um, sometimes it's handled in HC access file. Um, it can be handled within the database itself. Uh, it can be handled within the HTML or within the PH, like PHP itself. It depends. So it depends on the plugin you use, um, but. All, and there's a way to check it, so you can check. There are free tools out there so that if you set a 301 redirect, you can check to see that it, it actually is functioning as it should. But the plugin, not the plugin. Yeah, so um, the, 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 I, be, I believe within WordPress, it automatically will redirect some posts if you change the slug. Um, and, there are, and Yoast will do some of that too. Um, but the redirection plugin is like my favorite plugin to use. Um, and even within redirection, you can set how you want the redirect to, to act. without getting too technical, you can decide how you want the server to act on that redirection. Yeah. Is there a benefit of using 301 versus 302? Yeah, so 301 sets it permanently. So 301 makes it clear to browsers and search engines, like, we, this page is now over here. So it used to be at this URL, now it's in this URL. So th with 302, the question is whether 30, um, what is the, the benefits between, or the difference between using 301 and 302, and what the benefits are. Um, so with the, with the 302, um, you're, you're setting it temporarily. And so let's say you have a holiday, some sort of holiday special, and you want the, a, a specific page to go to another page for a temporary basis, and then you want that page to go back to the original page, then that's when you would use a 302. However, Google said that they, they look, if it, the 302 redirect is in place for a long period of time, say like six months, then they'll just treat it as a 301 redirect. But then you're tell, but you want, if you, if you do want it to be permanent, then you want them to know that it's permanent rather than having them guess, right? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. If you're making big website changes, you want to change categories, you want to go through, you want to clean stuff up. Yeah. 301 is helpful at some point, but then people start to learn. Now they go to this new page. Right. Do you have to keep that 301 there? Does the link juice eventually kind of migrate? So the question is, do you ha how long do you have to keep that 301 redirect if you've created the structure change, and how do you have to keep it to eternity or, or not, right? And so the answer is, the, if, if there are backlinks pointing to that old URL, then you definitely want to keep those 301 redirects in place. And so otherwise, it's going to still generate a 404 error. Because we know that a lot of people don't update their links, right? You know, that's a very common practice. And so um, you want to keep those 301 redirects for those pages specifically. And Google said, like, if you, after a certain time, like after a year or so, it doesn't matter. Like, they don't look, they, they know now that that redirect has been 
is permanent, and these are pages that don't have backlinks, right? These are URLs with no backlinks. They realize that, okay, this new URL is the new canonical, so which means the new, this is the new correct URL. So then you don't need to keep those three through one redirects for those other pages. So it depends. If there's backlinks, yes. If there's no backlinks, you can probably ditch them after a year. Yeah? You gloss over it real quick. Uh, you mentioned metas. Uh, what meta tags are and are not useful? Um, so, I, I, yeah, I think I talked about a little bit about meta. So, um, which meta tags are useful and not useful? So, the important meta tag when it comes to like SEO is the meta description. There are a lot of meta tags, for starters. And you can create a meta tag for anything because it's all information, right? So you, you can create a meta tag to do like site verifications and do all kinds of things. But when it comes to SEO, the, the meta description is the most important only in the sense that it allows that meta description to appear in the search results if the search query matches the content that's in that, in that meta description. There's no direct, you can stuff all the keywords you want, but it doesn't give you any kind of ranking boost because you have that in the meta description. All it does is it allows you to show that text within the meta description itself so that when people are searching for it, they can see that text get highlighted in the search results, which may lead to more clicks on your listing, right? Um, so that, that's the most important when it comes to, comes to SEO. Yeah. Um, so you have like really one product that's selling some housewife. Um, is there a good SEO bump by swapping that product out to say housewife instead? Sure. Um, yeah. If you, the question was like, if you have one single, if you have a single product, do you um, and you're using WooCommerce and you don't want to use that product um, with product within the URL, do you pull it out? I mean, you could. And you can market it easy, more, much more easily, right? I mean, you could tighten up that URL so it looks prettier. So even outside of like any SEO benefit that you get, like even just. Is there a global way to use redirects on something like that? Um, there, yes. You, I believe there's a way you can pull the product. And this is where it gets dangerous, mind you. There's a way you can probably put, pull the product out of WooCommerce. And I, I don't know the answer to that. But there could be a way to pull the product out of the URL. But if you do that, you have to make sure that you redirect. But then if you start adding products, then you might want to rethink your, your strategy. Um, and you know, ultimately, it's about the interlinking. It's about the structure. It's about like, thinking about your categories and how they link to one another, ultimately. So yeah. Uh, uh huh. Sure. I'm sorry, I, I missed the last part. If your site is not very content-heavy, yeah. it's a basic company website. Right, yep. It's a brochure site, yeah. Um, then there's only so much content you have to work with. So there's only so much advantage you can get from SEO and SEO. Correct. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the question is, do you, if you have a brochure site, like a minimal site with not that much content, there's only so much benefit you can get from site structure. And the answer is yes. Yeah. But you were talking about doing that for pages. Yeah. And is there a way to do that within WordPress itself, or do you need a plugin, or how do you do that? The question was about pages and whether it has to be able to assign categories to pages and tags. Well, you can't. You can't, add, you can't assign uh, um, categories and tags to pages themselves. But you can set the hierarchy within the pages themselves. So if you go into pages, you can actually set a um, a structure for the pages themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. I have a client that's trying to decide on an international address. Uh huh. Is the, you know, company name slash page number slash language name, or is it the name dot and? Uh, that's a totally different, different topic. That, yeah. Yeah. So we can talk about that after. Yeah. Yeah. I had a question on uh, categories and tags. Yeah. Quote unquote, 
tag stuff in there um, that's going to nullify the conformance. So in other words, you use a specific keyword for uh, category. <coughs> like you can't use the same keyword um, as far as tag is concerned. Ideally, yeah. Is that correct? <coughs> you cannot? Oh, so no, th the question is whether you can use the same keywords, keywords or same words for tags and category. You can. You can, but I mean. I thought that I read some articles about allowing this. Um, yeah. But basically, you're stating that uh, it's going to, it's going to, for one, it's just going to be very good as far as like testing the ranking and all. But the whole idea. Which part? Um, if you're using the same keywords and you're using way too many on tags, you use a specific amount of keywords. Is there like a number that you should use as far as keywords are concerned for categories? And there's something known as tag stuffing, right? Sure. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. It sounds. It's. Does that, does that make sense? Or does it make, I mean, it doesn't bother me if it does. No, no. It, sound, it sounds like something that it. it, um, it here, here's. Let me, let me answer it this way. Um, with categories, you are creating topic areas, right? Like you're organizing your content to fall under specific subjects, right? Um, with tags, you're getting a little more granular, right? That's, and that's just thinking about, um, that's not thinking about keyword stuffing, that's not thinking about like any, anything like that. Uh, it's more about um, ultimately, what, is it helping the user, is it helping the visitor, right? It's not about gaming Google or what is gonna knock you down, right? Because this is, the, this is all about like, how do we make the content easier to find? Um, how do we make it more user friendly? You know, for the most part, most I would say most blogs don't need tags, right? Like, unless you're getting very granular about things, then that's when you, the tags come into place, because like, you know, um, because those tags will generate pages, and then you end up with a bunch of pages that Google has to crawl, right? That don't need indexing. So, does that help answer? Yeah, definitely. I mean, one, one last question. I mean, okay. what do you recommend like, as far as you know, specific uh, articles or specific sites that you worry about categories and tags? Yeah. The, yeah, the Yoast, actually the Yoast website does a really good job with their content talking about site structure and um, the, the, the Yoast blog, the Moz blog, the Ahrefs blog also, those are all, I would consider those to be really good resources for, for SEO. Yeah. Right, so this kind of dovetails a little bit, I'll keep it real quick. Um, let's say I've got tags where you talk about similar and there's plural. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. Let's say I get rid of kettlebell Yeah. Would it be recommended at that point to do a 301 for the old tag page? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, kettlebell is the kettlebell. Because, you know, Google understands the difference between the two, right? Like, it even knows the difference between lawyer and attorney, you know? I mean, um, it knows that, I should say, it knows that they're one and the same, right? Somebody looking for an attorney is probably looking for a lawyer, vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It's okay, Matt. <laughs> No, I, I, I don't, I wouldn't use nofollow for, for any, really much of anything. Yeah, unless you, like, maybe blog comments, right? Like, that's by, on by default, right? Um, or if you're talking about um, somebody maybe you don't like, or you're talking about a subject matter that is controversial and you're just using it as an example, then you might nofollow that link, right? You're not endorsing that site, you're just linking to it because it's informative, yeah. Read, the readability score. Um, this is a little off topic too, but um, as far as readability score, like um, I wouldn't get too bogged down with it. You know, the important thing is to create unique original content that's compelling. And I, I know, like a lot of people get bogged down with the details um, of like of metrics, right? When really, and then you spend so much time doing that that you don't, you're not doing the work that you need to do, right? Like, which is create compelling original content 
making a site, creating a site that's very user friendly, you know. Um, so it's I think it's good as a as a benchmark and to know that you're moving in the right direction. And so then it's like, oh, I'm going to improve my content going forward. Um, but yeah, I I wouldn't get too bogged down in the details. Yeah, you've you've been. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So how do you get um, a lot of you know there's a lot of themes, the um, category pages are pretty ugly, not pages, but the category sections that the clip on is pretty ugly, right? Yeah. Not yeah. A lot of flexibility things like that. But one of my web projects that has a it's very blog driven, it's like fourteen hundred blogs and there's only five pages. So yeah. what we did is we created landing pages instead of categories. But like yeah. if it is just fully in place of category, we'd be better off customizing that category section to look nicer and using that to follow, like, make a better site map. Because right now what we do is we have the, um, again, we have, like, an actual page that links the blog posts to yeah. the yeah, uh, I, so the question is whether to use like landing pages as if you're using, if you already have landing pages created to use those landing pages versus going into like categories that you already have. And um, I have, I'm, I'm figuring that out still. That's Be a tough one, right? It is a tough one because if you already, I mean, if you have that landing page already and it's, and it's already connected to that content, you almost don't need it. Um, I'm experimenting with that now. Yeah is, is uh, the category versus landing page. Because there are, there are some instances where you end up with a site that has all these landing pages already created, have backlinks pointing to them, they, they're, they're already doing well, so then you don't want to mess with it, right? Um, and you're already linking to all that good content, so it's do, applying those best practices. So then maybe you don't need the category in that instance. I think we've got time so. for one question, maybe two if they're quick. Yeah. Yeah. So the different the question is the difference between category and tag. And and so the categories are are, are hierarchical. Okay, that I understand, but if if you you have uh, if Google index your category page in one that lists a thousand good posts yeah, yeah. in that category. Yep. And do the same thing on the page for the tag. Is yeah. that a technical SEO difference between that page being indexed and that one? Or no, it's it it's a page, right? So um, it, Google index it the same way. Bing will index it the same way. No, 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 no. But you want to optimize both. So, like, if you have tag pages and category pages, you want to optimize both of those pages as best as you can. Yeah. Any other questions? Cool. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks for sticking around. Yeah.